Debra. I'm a user experience researcher at Google where I work on Gmail and other related projects. Um, and in my spare time when I'm not at work, I uh, play volleyball, I like to cook, I go hiking, and I like playing with my four cats. Um, so I'm here to talk to you guys today uh, a bit about my personal story about how I came to my current career in technology and share some lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, but the first thing I want to say is, you know, I'm still early in my career, uh, so I still have a lot more that I want to accomplish. Uh, so I'm not going to pretend that I have it all figured out quite yet in terms of how to be successful. Uh, but there's, there are some things that I've learned along the way uh, that I'd like to share with you guys. Is I think there were things that helped me uh, that I learned about. So there's four things I want to talk about today um, in terms of the lessons that I've learned. Um, so the first is about uh, finding out your passion and then setting big goals around it. Uh, so for me, I discovered my passion for computers and technology actually pretty early. Uh, back when I was in the second grade and my parents bought us our very first home computer. And I remember spending countless hours using that computer and trying to you know, learn how to use all the programs and messing with the settings and trying to figure out how it worked. Uh, but it wasn't until I was in the seventh grade and I went to a career conference that I discovered that there were actually careers for building and designing technology. And I remember being really excited at that realization um, of learning that there were these careers and deciding back then and there that I wanted to be a software engineer. Uh, and so that was one of the first big goals that I've set for myself, uh, where a later goal I'll talk about is the goal to work at Google. Um, but this first goal of being a software engineer uh, was something that really helped me back then of, of setting that goal as it helps guide me along my way as I went through school. I set this goal, um, but the problem was at the time um, in my middle school, there weren't any classes for learning uh, programming. Um, so what I did was the second point, uh, the second lesson I learned was to learn on my own outside of class. Uh, so what I did was I uh, taught myself HTML uh, to build my own web pages uh, and gradually through trial and error learned this on my own. And this was back in 1997, back when the web was just first getting big and most websites looked something like this, pretty terrible by today's standards. Um, but this is the sort of thing I did, like I just made my own home pages and learned how things worked and how HTML worked. Um, and just you know, did that sort of thing for a few years. Uh, then, in high school, I decided that I wanted to take on a bit of a bigger project. So, I convinced my high school principal to let me redo the high school's website, um, even in exchange for credit. Um, and this was a really big learning experience for me, as this was, um, you know, I made some changes, and I, uh, not long after that, started getting feedback that people didn't like it. <laughs> And I remember like, being kind of surprised by that and realizing um, you know, this is the first time I got feedback from users of something that I've made. I remember realizing well, maybe I don't know everything there is to know already about how to design something for other people to use. Uh, but the point of this, um, of this you know, learning on your own, is that I would not have learned any of these lessons if I hadn't had the initiative to teach myself HTML and to like, find a way to apply this through making this uh, high school website. And this is something I've uh, learned, or I've experienced over and over throughout the years, that the most valuable lessons I've learned have been the things that I've learned on my own outside of class. You know, classes, like school is great for, you know, you learn a lot of important things and you learn, you know, a lot of um, different subjects, but what's often missing is a chance to get to apply those lessons, like to really apply what you're learning and um, to like, get a really deep understanding of something. Um, so for me, I've, I've always felt that I've learned a lot and um, learned the best lessons when I've um, taken charge and learned something for myself. So uh, fast forward a few years later, and I went to college and majored in computer science. So I'm still following toward that path of, toward my goal of being a software engineer. And I'll admit that classes in college were definitely a lot tougher than, than in high school. And I remember also having um, kind of a, a drop in my confidence, um, in part due to some of the guys in my classes, that I remember them loudly bragging in front of 
the class about how easy the programming assignment was and how quickly they got it done. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I spent hours writing my code, and that was not easy. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. I think I also kind of felt a bit of pressure to have to prove myself um, as you know, one of the few females in my computer science classes. Um, but I think, well, for some of the guys, they, you know, they were okay just being in the middle of the pack, not necessarily at the top of the, of the class. For me, I kind of like felt like I had to you know, be at the top of the class and really like, prove that I could make it. So I, I did work really hard, and I was at the top of my class. And that definitely helped in those cases where I hear those guys brag like, about how easy it was, but you know, knowing to myself, like, you know, I, I got a good grade. I know what I'm doing. So you know, this lesson about believing in myself was something that it did take me a while to learn. Uh, but the things that I found to help the most with that were uh, to continue learning on my own, so I really did know myself well. And then also to surround myself with mentors and other female friends that were in science and technology careers who were going through the same thing. So we could you know, really understand what we were going through. Um, so having that support network is definitely key. For me, when I was in my junior year of college and I was starting to think about jobs, I uh, started realizing that um, while I really liked coding and I was good at it, it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. Uh, I was realizing that in my computer science group projects, I was always volunteering to design the user interface rather than you know, work on the back end or the database or whatnot. And I realized that what I was really most interested in was learning about how to design technology for people, you know, technology that people want to use and that is easy for them to use. So it was hard for me to give up on that, that goal that I had of being a software engineer that I'd set so long ago. Uh, but for me, it was the right thing to do as I'd grown a lot and I'd learned and, and changed a lot since setting that goal. Um, and my interests had changed. So it was time to update that goal to reflect my new passion. Uh, so what I did was I went on to graduate school in a slightly different field called human-computer interaction. Uh, which is the study of how people use technology and how to design technology for people to use. And in grad school, I continued to do you know, all of these things of um, learning on my own outside of class, which I did through side projects and teaching myself new programming languages and jobs and internships. And I also set myself more big goals, including the goal of working at Google. And I think in part because I had that goal I really, of working at Google, I really dedicated myself to making sure that it happened, um, and I and, uh, was able to achieve that. That's uh, the lessons that I've learned so far um, that have led me to this point in my career. Um, so I'll quickly talk about uh, uh, what I do right now at Google, as it definitely uh, applies to the lesson for today. Um, so as I said before, I'm a researcher working on Gmail and some other related projects. Um, so a big part of what I do as a researcher is learn about how people currently use Gmail and just in general how they use email. So I'm curious like how many people here are Gmail users? Okay, <laughs> like almost everyone, that's great. So I'm definitely interested, you know, you're all like one specific user group um, of like high school students using Gmail. So I'd be, you know, really interested in learning about how you're using Gmail and uh, how you use uh, Gmail for certain communication rather than texting or, or Facebook or that sort of thing. Um, and so another part of what I do is uh, usability testing, which is part of what we'll be talking about today. Um, so the usability testing we do at Google um, will bring people into these usability labs that are pictured here and have them um, try out new features and we'll watch them as they do so, see what works for them and what didn't. Um, and we also uh, do something called eye tracking, which uh, the eye tracker is just a special uh, machine inside of the monitor that is able to see where someone is looking on the screen. So from that, we can create these nice heat maps, which show uh, which parts of the screen attract the most attention. Uh, so after doing this sort of research, what I do is I analyze uh, what, we, what we saw, and I'll present uh, recommendations to the team of uh, what works well and what we need to fix uh, to make the design better. Now, one lesson I've, I've learned so far at Google. Um, so Google, you know, we're not a startup anymore. We've gotten uh, bigger since 
our early days. Uh, but Google still definitely has a very entrepreneurial environment. And in entrepreneurial environments, you'll find that you're often you know, solving problems that no one has worked on before. And there's also no one telling you what to do or how to do it. Uh, so you have to really learn how to deal with that and figure out for yourself. So it, it's definitely a challenge some days to figure out what to do and how to do it, but it's also a big part of what I love about my job and um, why I would encourage you all to go into startups because they're such exciting problems to work on. In closing, so I've talked about you know, the four lessons I've learned so far of setting big goals and learning on your own and believing in yourself and being flexible as your goals change. Um, so looking at you guys, you are all already doing one of these things at least, of learning on your own outside of class, just by being here and participating in this program. Like, this is a great way to do that. There's, there's two main points um, that I hope you take away from this. So one is that user-centered design is about designing things with a user in mind. And secondly, that you are usually not your user. Uh, so I say usually in that case, uh, or in this case, because for, for this program, you may be designing, it, designing an app that you would also be a user for. So in that case, you know, it's okay to think about what you might like to see in that app. Um, but most of the time, you're probably not the user. And so that's why it's so important to talk to people who would be in your user group to find out um, what they want or what they need. How do you design with the user in mind? Um, so this is like the ideal design process to follow. Uh, and it's very similar, I think, to what you've been shown in past weeks about like, lean thinking and the process for that. Is that right? Um, so I think, yeah, there's something about like learning, building, and measuring. So this is you know, very much the same thing. Um, so I think you've talked already in past weeks about you know, these first two steps of defining and research were defined as like defining what is the goal of your app, what is it going to do. And research is starting to you know, do surveys or talk to your users um, about um, your idea and starting to get feedback on it. Uh, so what we'll talk about today is the next two parts of this process, which are designing and testing. Um, and so I think you talked about like lean thinking, how it's good to do like the smallest thing possible that will, the simplest thing, the fastest thing possible to get you feedback on your idea. So when you're designing, that means you're not designing the whole application, you're not building the whole thing right away. But what we'll talk about today is making a paper prototype, which is a very fast, simple way to sketch out your app and get feedback on it. I'll talk a bit about design first, and then I'll talk about testing designs. Um, so first, what is user interface design? Um, so the definition of interface is like the boundary of the link between two things. So a user interface is um, the, the interface between the person or the user using something and the hardware or the software that they're using. And in user interface design, it's about designing things that make sense for the people who use them. Uh, so imagine that you've been tasked with uh, designing a mobile phone for your grandparents or people your grandparents' age. Uh, so if you think about what would make sense for them, it's probably pretty different from uh, what would make sense if you were designing a phone for people your age. When you think about older people, they might you know, have a slightly uh, worse vision that would make it hard to see small things on the screen. And it also might be hard to type with, or to press like tiny buttons. Um, and also what people might want out of the phone would be different. Like they, the people, you know, older uh, people may not be interested in like, all the latest gadgets and features, but what they really care about is staying in touch with their kids and their grandkids. Um, so this picture here is the jitterbug phone, which I believe was designed for older adults. And you can see some of the design features it has, like the very large buttons and a simple interface. A lot of people, when they think of design, they think it's just about like, how something looks and it's about looking nice. But design is a lot more than that. It's about, um, it's about uh, designing how something works so that it solves the needs that your users have. Uh, so I'll go over a couple tips about designing user interfaces. So the first thing to keep in mind is that people have expectations about how things should work. Um, and we call these mental models in this field. Um, so a model is a simplified representation of the world. 
uh, and a mental model is the representation we have in our heads about how something should work, or how something will work. Uh, and we, these mental models are based on our past experience. And they're also based on like, the visual cues that we see that give us clues about how something will work. Um, so we form these mental models in our heads of these expectations we have. And then we use those when we encounter new things to try and guess how that new thing will work. Uh, so an example of that. Let's say you go to a building, a new building that you've never been to before, and you see these doors. So uh, someone tell me, would you push these doors or pull? How do you open them? She said um, she thinks you pull because there's a handle. So yeah, if you see like with doors, there's this visual cue of handle that's giving you a clue of what to do. So you know, you've opened doors like that in the past, so you expect that this door will also work the same way. Um, but actually, these doors have a tiny sign there, maybe hard to see, but it says push. You actually push these doors. And this is bad design. This uh, is bad design because it's violating people's expectations of how something should work. This is something you know you should keep in mind so you can try and avoid doing this in your own designs. Uh, so there's a couple ways to uh, uh, to avoid violating expectations. Um, that's you know so what you want to do is follow existing patterns. So um, two things that you can do to help with this. So one is to follow design patterns. Um, design patterns are just a term for solutions to common problems in user interface design. So that's what this is a picture of here, is that this is a design pattern for the, the common problem of selecting multiple items from a list. So it's showing that kind of like the standard way to do this is you show these check boxes um, to select multiple items, and then an action bar appears at the bottom that shows you the actions you can take with the items you selected. So those websites there at the top are places where you can see examples of those design patterns. And another way to follow existing patterns is to use analogies. So you may have noticed that you know, a lot of websites, they use a shopping cart. If they're an e-commerce website, uh, a picture of a shopping cart. And they use a picture of a trash can uh, for deleting things. And the reason this is done is because people, um, they have a mental model of what a trash can does or what a shopping cart is for. So you know, people know that when they see a trash can, it means delete. And they use that prior knowledge so that when they use your app, which they've never seen before, they'll be able to guess what that trash can does in their app. One more tip on how else to design uh, with the user in mind. So there's two remotes here. So let's say that you, know, you were using what you wanted to use one of these remotes to play something. Which remote would you rather use? Now there's a lot of things that you could include in your apps. Uh, but it's generally a good idea to keep things very simple, to solve one problem really well, instead of trying to cram every feature that someone might want to use. So what that often does is ends up overwhelming the user, confusing them um, as they try and use your app. So what paper prototypes are, are hand-drawn sketches of each screen of your app. And they're a fast and easy way to get feedback. Um, so how they work is uh, you draw these screens and then you test them out with someone um, where when you're testing, you get to play the role of the computer. Um, you know, since it's on paper, it doesn't actually work. So someone will tap something on the screen and you'll play computer and go to the next screen. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you a quick video of what uh, a paper prototype looks like. Steps that will uh, get people to accomplish that goal. 
Uh, and then from there, for factorizing, you draw out the screens that you need um, for people to be able to do that. Uh, and you saw in that video that so sometimes it's a separate screen, and sometimes just part of the screen changes. It's so like they had the little drop down menu in that video. So in that case, like they just cut out the little drop down menu uh, since that was the only part of the screen that changed. So this video, um, there's this guy who's he's designing an online coloring book. Um, so his uh, target audience for this online coloring book is young kids. So he's, um, to do his, his uh, test for this prototype, he's found someone that matches you know, the, the type of person, of user he's designing for. So he'll, he'll, he's interviewing a preschooler here. Um, and there's two points I'll make about this video. Um, so he talks about paying your participant for, um, for the participating, and so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and the other thing is, um, he's also used a computer to make his prototype, so his will look a bit more polished. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, don't worry about how nice his looks, because you know, with paper prototype testing, you're not testing um, how it looks, you're testing how it works for people. So it does not need to look. So Amelia, thank you very much for being here for this feasibility test today. We're planning a brand new website for kids, and we'd like your help. For your help today, I've got a special present for you after we finish. You see that? Oh, you'll get it when we're done. And this shouldn't take more than about 30 minutes. If you need to take a break at any time, just let me know, and you can take a break, OK? Before we begin, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Um, first, how often do you go online? Every day. <laughs> what websites do you go to? And what's your favorite website? Oh, so you have so there's more than one website you like? Do your do your mom and daddy let you go online anytime you want? Oh, okay. So when do you get to go online? This pen will be your mouse. Uh, if you want to click on something, just tap on it with your pen. So what what do you think about this website? It is great. <laughs> what, what's great about it? What do you think you can do from here? I can choose these coloring pages and videos. Great. Okay, thank you. I want you to remember that you came here to find pages to color them. Okay. Alright? So that's what I'd like you to do is find some pages to color. What would you do? I can click on here. Okay. Well, when you click on there, it takes you to a page like this. Is this what you expect? Yes. What do you think you can do from here? You can click on the buttons. And what would that do? Take you to color and do this. Okay, well, what would you want to click on? Ceratops? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, let's go to the kitty one, okay? So that's where you do. Okay. 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 To this page. Is this what you expected? What do you think you can do from here? So let's let's try that again. You you you, you touched over here first, right? Mm -hmm. You do that again. Let's do it very slowly. Click on yellow. Now let's let me give you a yellow marker. There you go. Well, and click. What would you do next? Okay. You click there. Okay. You click there. This will become yellow. 
And that would become yellow, like that. Okay, what else would we do? Okay. Now, is this the best texture of sugar? Yeah. You put on blue, then what? Yes. 